Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to my second floor lair. T today's topic is Wrestlest Remarkable Books number 14. How do you like my coffee mug with the Starbucks logo? Very popular and c cool coffee. Just remember when you're out in a public place to uh, make sure people can see the logo on your Starbucks coffee if you're having Starbucks. Although I think they have the logo on both sides, so maybe that's not an issue. So, anyway, uh, the first book today is The Custom of the Country by Edith Wharton, published in 1913. Uh, Edith Wharton's a fine classical novelist, and she, she wrote this book. It kind of reminds me of Madame Bovary, which I haven't talked about yet. But uh, anyway, this character, Undine Sprague, she has an insatiable desire for luxury and admiration for her beauty. So this, this, this leads to tragic consequences. Um, so Edith Wharton, this is a very entertaining uh, novel. It's set in the early part of the 20th century and captures the spirit of the country. It kind of reminds me of um, F. Scott Fitzgerald and you know, these authors who wrote about the United States in the early part of the country. This is a very fine novel. I, I recommend The Custom of the Country by Edith Wharton. The next book is Cold Sea Rising by Richard Moran, published in 1986. Now, this is a, an Antarctic thriller, and it depicts the, uh, he's talking about the Ross Ice Shelf. And now, the, the, uh, the Ross Ice Shelf is a large uh, amount of ice, and, and it's over the ocean rather than the land. So he's talking about the possibility of this Ross Ice Shelf breaking away and drifting north. Now, I believe, actually, uh, all the time small pieces are, are falling off or breaking away. But in this, in this case, he's talking about the entire Ross Shelf drifting north and then melting, and would, which would lead to, a, supposedly, in this story, uh, the rise in the ocean level of 20 feet, which would be, which would be really something. So this is a, this is a fine, fine uh, Antarctic thriller, kind of like Tom Clancy and Paul Erdman. The next book is uh, actually four books in one volume, and the titles are The Poison Belt, The Land of Mist, The Disintegration Machine, and When the World Screamed by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, published around 1920. Now, these are sequels to The Lost World uh, with the amazing uh, character Professor Challenger. So Arthur Conan Doyle not only created a wonderful character, Sherlock Holmes, but this Professor Challenger who has these uh, adventures with dinosaurs. And you could call this pioneer science fiction. It includes uh, spiritualism, psychic phenomena, and it's ecologically significant. It's a fantastic book. I highly recommend this uh, novel. Well, actually, four shorter novels, or novelettes, or long short stories published together by the wonderful author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Well, we'll have the telephone's ringing, but we'll ignore that and, and keep going, because, you know, the show must go on, as I say. The next book is Beyond the Farthest Star by Edgar Rice Burroughs, published in 1941. So this is one of his latter novels. Remember, the, the creator of Tarzan. And uh, this is a, a fine story. Now I got to listen to myself on the, on the recording. I'm, I'm very sorry about this. We'll say who it is if, if it is anyone. Probably no one will say, say anything. Okay, let's continue. So anyway, this uh, individual in this novel is named Tangor. And he was an American soldier who had been killed in the Second World War. And then, then he reincarnated in this land, this, this uh, sort of a science fiction land of Paluda, uh, to help the, uh, the Uni people, or the Unis, to fight the Capors. So this is science fiction, and it deals with reincarnation. Very interesting. And, uh, of course, uh, by the creator of Tarzan. The next book is Robinson Crusoe, U.S. Navy, The Adventures of George R. Tweed, RMI on Japanese-held Guam by George Tweed, Blake Clark, and D. Turner Givens, published in 1945. And I read this book when I, I spent a year in Guam, which is this, the large island in Micronesia, these small islands east of the Philippines in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, this is a, a book that I read. It's a wonderful book. 
It's about the story about this fellow. You know, when the, when the Japanese attacked, uh, started the war, and they not only attacked Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, but uh, other part, other areas that uh, in that area which were American under American control, the Philippines, Guam, and so forth. And this is the story of the Japanese invasion and and conquest of Guam. And this fellow, and of course it was a U.S. island, had a lot of American uh, military personnel. Lots of them tried to get away or left, or some were captured. And this is about, there were a few of them who uh, who tried to hide uh, and went into the jungles and tried to hide from the Japanese. And this George Tweed was the one who who spent, uh, who was able to elude the Japanese. They weren't, were never able to capture him. His, I think his friends, he had a couple of friends he was with who, I believe either died or were captured. But anyway, he and he got a lot of help from the Chamorro people or the local people of Guam before he finally was able to get off the island to a U.S. Navy ship. So this this it's, it's a contra, he's a controversial person. You know, after the war, he came back and he gave this uh, very nice automobile to one of the Chamorros who had helped him, actually the longest, but actually a number of people had helped him. And then there was jealousy about you know, that they all wanted a car, and he only gave one to one person. But, you know, they, you know, it was wonderful what they did. They, you know, they risked their lives, and they were very loyal to the United States during the Second World War, and they kind of proved that loyalty by helping Americans who were hiding in the jungle. You know, he had to be, they had to bring him food. He was brought food, and and he was staying on people's property. Uh, so, uh, and that, you know, they risked their lives, that they would get in trouble. They could get, because uh, the Japanese were, were very harsh. So this is a fine story about this fellow in Guam and his experiences hiding from the Japanese in the Second World War. The next book is The Three Daughters of Madame Leon by Pearl S. Buck, 19, published in 1969. Of course, Pearl Buck is the famous American author who wrote novels about China because that was her specialty. That's where she had lived for many years. And this is a, this is a wonderful, wonderful little novel. It's very, it, it depicts the tragedy of communist China and, uh, you know, what, what, what the Chinese people went through under the communist government. And uh, it is a blend of tragedy, reality, strength, and happiness. So, you know, people making the best of it, going through hard times and dealing with a very difficult government, which was, uh, but, you know, that's, this is what we all have to do in life, make the best of it, no matter what goes on, you know, political Political situations can be tough, and it, you, you might find yourself in a situation where the government is pretty bad, and, or really bad, and you, what are you going to do? You have to live your life, do what you can. And so that's what she's talking about in this fine novel of, of life in China under the, during the communist regime when, when it was, there was much less freedom than, than there is now in China. The next book is Duty and Dishonor by Dale Dye, published in 1992. I found this the, uh, the best Vietnam War book I'd ever read. And uh, he hit all angles of that era. Very good history and post-war history. And, of course, the, the most uh, the tragic uh, events of April 1975, which were so hard on so many people, when, when Saigon fell to the North Vietnamese. And it was so hard on the American soldiers who had served you know, because, it, you know, the war was lost. South Vietnam fell to, the, to North Vietnam. And, of course, it was also very hard on the South Vietnamese because uh, I, have a, I have a neighbor down the hall whose family was from South Vietnam, and they eventually left because there was, after the war, the, uh, the, South, the North Vietnamese kind of were pretty hard on the South Vietnamese after they took over. The next book is Jules Verne, The Man Who Invented the Future. By Franz Born, published in 1963. Well, this is the biography of, of Jules Verne. It's a fine story because, you know, this Jules Verne was an amazing fellow. All the incredible books that he wrote and the fact that he was the father of, uh, of science fiction. And like they say, when Jules, Jules Verne would write about it, then it would become reality. Submarines, the space program, polar exp exploration. And that's why, for example, in the... Uh, in the movie Back to the Future, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, scientist who was helping Marty, you know, who was able to build this uh, time travel car, he named his two sons, Jules and Verne. Nice tribute to this uh, wonderful author from France, uh, many uh, from the 19th century. 
The next book is Breathing Lessons by Ann Tyler, published in 1988. There's another fine novel by, by Ann Tyler, who is this uh, uh, w- wonderful uh, author of, of fiction about uh, life in the United States in the uh, latter part of the 20th century. And in this story, the two characters are Maggie and Ira. They're a married couple. And they reminded me a lot of my, my parents because because uh, Maggie, you know, she's a mother and a wife. She's the eccentric planner, you know, and she's always coming up with ideas, kind of eccentric, very interesting and creative. And then Ira, who is the quiet, supportive, semi-skeptic. So they have an interesting, you know, he interesting uh, marriage, and actually a pretty good marriage, I'd have to say. They, the, they're overall they're good to each other, but they don't always get along. But I think they actually had a had a good marriage, and talks about the reality of marriage and how you know you have two people trying to get along and and being different and trying to accept each other and be tolerant and forgive, you know, because they'll. You can, we, can, we often hurt each other. Fine novel, breathing lessons. The next book is The Making of the President, 1968, by Theodore H. White, published in 1969. Now, I read, I believe, most of his, his books. He wrote, Theodore White wrote books about American presidential elections. And uh, starting, I believe, in 1960, up until... Oh, maybe 1976. And anyway, this is, you know, the, I think the 1968 was, was a fascinating election. And he does, does such a good job of, of talking about everything that happened. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's well written. You know, it's, it's very entertaining. And all the characters, of course, that are trying to, vying to become president. Lyndon Johnson, who by all rights should have been president, but because of the, or re-elected, but because of the uh, Vietnam War, he was became extremely unpopular. So he uh, he decided to to pull out. He didn't run, and so that that really opened the floodgates of candidates trying to become president. And Eugene McCarthy was the was the challenger who actually had uh, done quite well in a, in one of the primaries. So he was an early front runner for the Democrats. And then Robert Kennedy, of course, uh, made his uh, run of course until he was until he was killed, and then. Hubert Humphrey got the nomination, and then in among the Republicans, Nelson Rockefeller, you know, from the famous Rockefeller family, he challenged Richard Nixon, but wasn't able to wasn't able to uh, to to win. And uh, of course, and he was one of the old in the old days a liberal Republican. So it was a very interesting uh, election. It was, you know, a lot going on in the country. There's so much chaos, the Vietnam War and the youth movement, and lots going on. And it was it was really tough. And according to this book that. White is saying that both Hubert Humphrey, who was the Democratic nominee, and uh, Nix, Richard Nixon were both fine candidates. But it was a very difficult time in, in our country's history. The next book is The Return of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs, published in 1913. This is the second of the 24 Tarzan novels. And it's really something. You know, it starts where he's in Paris. France, and then he travels to Algeria in North Africa, and then to Central Africa, and finally to Opar, the city of gold, which is, you could say, fictional. I don't know how much basis there was for this. So, you know, Tarzan was a very interesting character because he could, uh, he spo- he could speak many different languages, and then he could adapt to different situations. You know, he could live as a European he could live as an Arab in North Africa, and he could li- he could live as a, a sub-Saharan African, and then also as as a gorilla, as an ape. And in this book, uh, he and Jane get married. So, for those of you who are into romance, you know, and they, they had a good marriage, uh, Tarzan and Jane. The next book is the Magnific- Magnificent Ambersons by Booth Tarkington, Tarkington, published in 1918. Oh, I thought this was a tremendous novel. And it's, it was an old classic that's been kind of forgotten. Wonderful story. And it's a real shame that uh, Tarkington has been forgotten today. This is not Fran Tarkin, Tarkington, uh, Booth Tarkington. And so in, in the back, there's an interesting creative thing written on the back of the book where it says that his, the future of Tarkington is in my hands because they were hoping that, uh, you know, some publisher decided to republish the would have been kind of a forgotten, wonderful novel, and came out, you know, this was republished, and so the, they were saying, uh, it's in your hands, the future of birth, Booth Target, and so it's nice that I can talk about this book, and hopefully to promote it so others might read it, 
And uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful chronicle of the beginning of the automobile age. And in this case, the fall of the House of Amberson, this wealthy family that had you know, done real well, but, but fell on hard times. Their, their wealth dissipated because that's how life is. You know, you, the times keep changing and the products and services people want change. So you have to keep up if you want to keep going. And, and the, the wonderful stories or parts of this book is when uh, you know, these early fellows who would buy automobiles and be out riding them, they were considered kind of crazy people. You know, like, look at this guy. What's he doing? Because the, the automobiles would be noisy and they would often break down. And then fellows would be driving and they'd be, you know, by the side of the road with a broken down automobile. And then a guy on a horse would pass by and say, kind of make fun of them, say, get a horse. That's what they used to say, make fun of the uh, horse. Uh, and in time, we know what happened. We know how automobiles came to dominate our country and the whole world and how horse travel pretty much disappeared. You know, very few horses today. So it's a wonderful novel. The next book is Prisoners of the Japanese by Gavin Dawes, published in 1994. Yeah, this is about the Second World War and the, the Japanese treatment of other peoples in the war, and they were, they were very cruel. They were very hard on them. You know, if they, I know there were stories in, in Guam where if they didn't bow down, you know, show enough respect to the Japanese, they, they'd cut off people's heads. And uh, so they were, it was, they were very, very cruel and very hard on the people. But the one thing you have to remember is they were also hard on themselves. You know, it was a very strict culture. So we should try to try to see the whole see the whole the whole thing, the whole story, the Japanese. And of course, they were trying to establish this empire very very quickly. You know, and other countries had to establish empires, and so the Japanese were were doing it in a very tough way. And of course, they eventually failed. And then, of course, when the war ended, we found the Japanese were not really a, they were not a violent people. They were they were peaceful people. They were good people. Just during the war, this is what they were all compelled to do because it was part of building their empire. The next book is Rebound: The Odyssey of Michael Jordan by Bob Green, published in 1996. Well, this is, you know, if you recall, Michael Jordan was the famous basketball player who retired. You know, his father had been murdered, and then he retired from basketball, and then he, he played baseball. He played minor league baseball for one year. And then, of course, he came back to the NBA after after that, and, and you know, he won three championships, retired, played baseball, and came back, and then won three more with the Chicago Bulls. So this is about when he, he, he came back to the game and and, you know, about, it was tough. I think the death of his father it would be very, very hard to have, you know, lose your father at a young age, and especially having your father being murdered, and then, you know, and so this is what he went through, his grief, and then trying to play baseball, that was kind of a tough experience for him, because, you know, he, he didn't do very well. I kind of wished he'd been able to play another year, but he didn't, because there was a baseball strike, and he wanted to come back. He played, actually, he was a, his manager in the minor leagues was Terry Francona, who's the current manager of the Cleveland Indians. So Michael Jordan, and as they called MJ, he won six cha NBA championships in the 1990s. The next book is The Beasts of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs, published in 1914. You can see I was kind of on an Edgar Rice Burroughs kick. And uh, in this uh, novel, Tarzan enlists Akut the Ape and others and Sheeta the Panther to fight the evil Russian Count Rakov who apparently had abducted uh, his wife, Jane, and by this time they had a baby, Jack. So he, he needed help. This, this Russian fellow, the evil Russian uh, character who had kidnapped his wife and son, and uh, they got them back. So that was good. And, and he was able, he, uh, Tarzan used to, uh, got his friends who were jungle animals to help him in this quest. And one of, one of uh, Burroughs' famous uh, phrases he likes to use uh, when referring to the darkness of the jungle, it's the Stygian darkness. <laughs> very, very interesting expression, kind of very quaint. The next book is The Autobiography of Malcolm X, as told to Alex Haley, published in 1964. This is a wonderful book, and I, I really, really enjoyed it. Of course, Malcolm X was this African-American who became a Muslim, you know, the African-American the African -American Muslim movement in our country. And because they they believed that you know, Christianity had been a, a religion of slavery, you know they were they were looking for something different. So this is what he did. Now now he he had uh, you know he had been this African American fellow who uh, who had been in prison. And the, the 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 thing about his life is when he was in prison, 
He read a lot of books because he had a lot of time on his hands. And this is what changed him. This is what made him a great man. When he came home, got out of prison, he'd been arrested for something. I'm not sure for robbery, I believe. He was in prison for a few years. When he came home to his, his neighborhood, he was changed. He, 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 was, he was, became powerful. And a lot of it had to do with his, he had read so much. He became very knowledgeable. And so this shows the, how powerful book reading is. And that's why I'm making these videos and, and how knowledge is power. And uh, anyway, so he was str struggling with his identity. He changed his name to Malcolm X, X meaning he did, the X meaning he didn't know his last name because when the Africans were brought to America, they didn't have, their family names were lost if they had family names. And of course, back then, people's around the, people around the world didn't have family name, names until it was really the modern world where everyone had to take a family name. And it was very tragic, his, his death, he was... Uh, Elijah, he had a conflict with Elijah Muhammad, who was the uh, the leader of the American Muslim community, and uh, uh, Malcolm X was shot 16 times in the chest from a sawed-off shotgun while giving a speech in Harlem, New York City. And uh, now the thing is, Malcolm X was a part of the called the Black Power movement, and he was a rival of uh, of Martin Luther King. And uh, actually, he was, you know, really became sort of very angry with white people, European descent Americans. And then he traveled to Mecca, of course, as the holy city of Muslims. And he found there, there were, there were many, uh, uh, you know, you could say white Muslims, which would be people from, or light-skinned Muslims from North Africa or even from uh, the Balkan Peninsula. So uh, he really overcame that racism and he realized that racism was wrong, that, you know, Islam had people's from all different shades of, of skin color. So I think this, this is a very, I really recommend this book. It's very compelling. And you know, Malcolm X played a major role in American history in helping African Americans have a sense of pride and, and believe in themselves. And and because uh, the slavery and what they'd been through was, was very depressing. And uh, of course, uh, Muhammad Ali is another example of a fellow who became a Muslim, changed his name. He'd been Cassius Clay. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in the NBA had been Lou Alcindor, another famous one, Ahmad Rashad, who played in the NFL. So this is a very, I really recommend this book. It's very interesting. The, the American Muslims community, which are primarily African Americans. The next book is The Silver Bears by Paul Erdman, published in 1974. Again, he writes these financial thrillers, and it's kind of like James Bond. You have these uh, exotic locations like Las Vegas and Lugano, and Zurich, Switzerland, also Iran, Turkey, and London. So it's very, uh, you know, it's very exciting. There's a lot of banking uh, information and uh, lots of lar large dollar amounts, big, large amounts of money are involved in, in stories like this. Uh, Paul Erdman. The next book is Emily of New Moon by Lucy Maud Montgomery, published in 1923. Actually, Lucy Maud, uh, Maud Montgomery, she created uh, not only Anne of Green Gables, which had eight books, and then there's this uh, Emily series. There was ser a series of three, and then the, th the other character she carried was, created was Pat of Silverbush, Pat, Patricia, and then, of course, the standalone novels. So anyway, I moved on to the Emily series after I finishing with Anne of Green Gables, and again, it reminded me of the TV show The Waltons, uh, this character was a budding poetess. poetess. She write, liked to write poetry. And her birthday was May 19th, same birthday as my father and, Ma and Malcolm X. So it's in a very kind of similar to Anne of Green Gables, these wonderful novels set in Prince Edward Island, Canada, in the early part of the 20th century. The next book is Jungle Tales of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs, published in 1916. Yeah, this is number six in the Tarzan trilogy. Uh, if, you, if you like uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs' books, you're called an Urbaniac. They had this, I joined this association of people who love the books of Edgar Rice Burroughs. And I, had a, I have a friend named Mrs. Denko. She would, she would approve of this because she really believes in reading the classics. This would be considered pulp fiction, not, not high literature. And uh, so in this book, uh, there's some very interesting parts where Tarzan challenged the moon. You know, and just imagine that it was a full moon, and he had uh, nightmares from bad elephant meat. Of course, he realized he shouldn't have been eating elephant meat because that was his friend, the elephant. And uh, and then later he saved the moon from destruction during an eclipse. 
you know, the, he believed that, uh, I can't remember what, what he did, but, you know, the, the, during an eclipse, of course, the moon disappears, it can under a full eclipse, and he believed that he had played a role in uh, saving the moon. So, and then he uses this expression, hither and thither, and his friend Tantor the Elephant. So this is another fine novel, by, of, of tar, a Tarzan novel by Edgar Rice Burroughs. The next book is Oh Baby, I Love It by Tim McCarver with Ray Robinson, published in 1987. Well, this is another baseball book. Tim McCarver was a catcher who played uh, for the St. Louis Cardinals, was a star player, and he also was a, a TV, uh, baseball TV fellow who would broadcast games, uh, uh, describe the, the action if you watch a game on TV, and he's, he's a funny guy, and this is something that, this is a book that I, would, I read in the Philippines, because I didn't have the Cleveland Plain Dealers sports section. So while I was eating my breakfast of cold cereal, milk, and peanut butter toast, I, could, I read this book by Tim McCarver, who's a very good fellow. The next book is The Paragon by John Knowles, published in 1971. It's, it's a pretty good book. It's another uh, Knowles uh, yarn of troubled youth. And... Uh, you know the confusion of young, with young people. There, there are issues with relationships, and he he gets into the topic of fatherhoods. You know, the, again, the creator, the guy who wrote a separate piece, John Knowles, who wrote about young people. The next book is Oh God by Avery Corman, published in 1971. Uh, this was uh, lent to me by a friend of mine on Guam, and uh, because his. He had a friend who told him that God should have a face. And now, if you've seen the famous movie with George Burns, who played God, and this is a wonderful story because it's it's really important if 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 God can God can become real to us. And uh, you know that's the real problem we have is God isn't real. You know it's it's a, it's a word, and even if we go to church and believe in God, but He's not really real. So this 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 was a great book and movie that helped people. To believe that God, God is real. That God is this very powerful, loving being who cares about us. And as a, there's a wonder, the, the end of the book and the movie, the character played by I think it was John Denver. You know, says you know what, God was leaving, and they were they wouldn't be able to talk anymore. And then, so uh, he tells him, well, you know, what am I going to do? And he says, well, you talk and I'll listen. But actually, from what I in, in my church, we're taught that if, if we are able, if we persist enough. God will respond, and we will really be able to feel uh, Him speaking with us, and and, and His presence known, and, and guiding us. Because we, you know, we all need help in life. Life is hard. It's so easy to make mistakes and get in trouble. And God can help us to to avoid these, uh, avoid making mistakes, and or to and to make the best of life, and to fulfill our destiny of 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 making a contribution to this world and making it a better place. The next book is Temporary Insanity by J. Johnstone, published in 1985. This is another baseball book. And J. Johnstone was a player for the Philadelphia Phillies, a real, a real free spirit. You know, he had, uh, he had uh, these guys joke around a lot. And sometimes, you know, the, these different pranks they would play on each other, like putting talcum powder in someone's uh, cap or putting bubble gum in their shoe or even lighting their lighting their uh, shoelaces on fire. So he's talking about these different pranks the fellows do because you know, maybe they're sitting in the dugout or before the games and, and so forth. So Jay Johnson was a fine baseball player back in the, I think, the 70s and 80s. The next book is Chesapeake by James A. Mishner, published in 1978. Yeah, this is, a, this is one of uh, Mishner's fine uh, historical novels, Chesapeake Bay, which is this huge... Very large body of water, which is, which leads to the Atlantic Ocean on the east coast of the United States, and uh, where the Potomac River, where Washington D.C. is, flows into, and also uh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, is uh, a port on the uh, Chesapeake Bay, and you have the states of Virginia and Maryland and and Delaware. It's a very interesting place, and and York, the Battle of Yorktown, the the decisive battle. And the American Revolution was is also on the Chesapeake Bay. This is a fine historical novel by James A. Mishner. The next book is Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle by Edgar Rice Burroughs, published in 1927. This is number 11 of the Tarzan books. 
And when I was in Guam, I really got carried away with reading Tarzan books. And according to this uh, story, in the Middle Ages, there were crusading knights, you know, crusaders, these fellows who'd come from Europe to the Holy Land, and somehow they lost their way and ended up in, uh, um, in 20th century Ethiopia. So it's, uh, that's, that's what's, those are main players in this book. And then you have uh, other peoples, the uh, Arabs, North Africans, and the Sub-Saharan Africans, and uh, apes, and good old Lord Greystoke, John Clayton, Tarzan, Lord of the Jungle. Hey, Tim. I think it's done. The next book is The Son of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs, published in 1918. Uh, this is a, yeah... Boy, gosh, just imagine another Tarzan book. Uh, this is, you know, Tarzan, this is about his son Jack, who had grown up and was fall, falling, following the footstep of his father and becoming a denizen of the jungle under the tutelage of Akut the ape. And then he met a young lady who was named Miriam, who was a daughter of a Frenchman who had been kidnapped by Arabs. It was a very happy ending when Tarzan and Jane find their long-lost son, Jack, and uh, he, was called, he took the uh, name of Karak. And, uh, uh, they, uh, and so uh, Jack, and uh, also known as his, his jungle name was Karak, uh, he and Miriam get, uh, are reunited and get married in the end. So there's a lot of action. You know, this is about Tarzan's son, uh, Jack, also known as Karak. Very interesting story. Well... It uh, looks like we're out of time, so thank you very much for watching. Just, just remember how wonderful books are, and I wish you well. God bless you. God bless the Philippines, America, and the whole world, and uh, I'll see you next time.